the previous classes, we have been learning about the melting practices, treatment of the molten metal and how to remove the gases from the molten metal. Now, once we pour the molten metal into the mould, the metal solidifies. Now, in this lecture, we will be seeing the solidification phenomenon, how does it occur and how to control the solidification. Before we learn about the solidification phenomenon in a casting, it is necessary for us to learn about certain terminology. First, let us see there is a term called nucleation. What is this nucleation? The solidification of the casting occurs by nucleation and growth. Nucleation refers to the process in which tiny solid particles called nuclei are formed when liquid metal cools below its liquidus temperature. Now, you must be knowing the liquidus temperature. Anyway, I will show you the liquidus temperature. Here we can see this is the phase diagram of nickel and copper. Now, here we can see there are two lines are there and this is the liquidus line means everything above this liquidus line is liquid. Now, this is the solidus means everything below this line is solid. In between is the liquid plus solid that is the mushy zone. Now, here this is the nickel and copper alloy system. Now, nucleation is a process of formation of stable crystallization centers of new phase, right. Means between liquidus line and solidus line, this nucleation takes place. Now, how does it takes place? What is the, how does it, this nuclei form? And here we can see, these are the solute molecules, small, small solute, what say molecules are there. Now, all these are clustered together and a nucleus is formed. You see, this is the form nucleation. This nucleus will be developing and it grows and finally, it will become a crystal. And here we can see clearly. This is the, here we can see three figures. One is the formation of nuclei, growth of nuclei into crystal and completely solidified grains. And here we can see there is everywhere there is liquid, but this here we can see something immediately below the liquidus line. And here we can see these are the nuclei, this is one nucleus, this is one nucleus, this is one nucleus and so on. Now, these nuclei will be growing and they, they will be joining together and see here they have become crystals. Still little liquid is there, some more liquid is there. Now, these crystals will be growing, finally, they will become grains. So, this is one grain, this is one grain, this is one grain. Now, this is the grain boundary. So, this is another grain boundary. So, this is another grain boundary. Likewise, the solidification takes place. First, formation of the nuclei. Next, this nuclei will be growing and growing into crystals then these crystals will be growing into grains. The once grains are formed, the casting is, solidification is over. Now, this nucleation is primarily, there are two types. One is the primary nucleation and another one is the secondary nucleation. Under, uh, under the primary nucleation, again there are two types. One is the homogeneous and another one is the heterogeneous. Now, we will see all these. Now, let us see this homogeneous nucleation. It occurs spontaneously without the help of foreign particles. No foreign particles or no impurities are required for this homogeneous nucleation. Next one is the heterogeneous nucleation. It occurs with the help of foreign particles or impurities and generally this occurs in a casting during at the beginning of solidification especially nearer to the mould wall, there will be impurities will be there. So, these impurities will be acting as the foreign particles and because of that, they will be acting as the nucleating agents. So, this is the heterogeneous nucleation and third one is the secondary nucleation. When tiny crystals of the same material exist and act as seed crystals, it results in the 
secondary nucleation. Such nuclei are known as the secondary nuclei. So, there are totally we can see there are three types of nucleation, one is the homogeneous, second one is the heterogeneous and third one is the secondary nucleation. But in casting, in the castings, generally this heterogeneous nucleation will be dominating. Now, in this heterogeneous nucleation, solid phase crystallizes on a foreign particle, right, that results in larger nucleus. Initially, there will be some, say, impurities will be there nearer to the mold wall. Around these impurities, right, the metal solidifies and it becomes in a larger nucleus. Next one, degree of supercooling is needed for solidification, is, right. Next one, homogeneous nucleation is the dominating mechanism in the early stage of solidification, because in the early stage of the solidification, what happens? The solidification commences from the mold walls and slowly it progress in, progresses inside. Now, nearer to the molding walls, there will be impurities and because of these impurities, there will be heterogeneous nucleation at the what say uh, early stage of the solidification. As the solidification is progressing inside, there will be scarcity of impurities, then there will be homogeneous nucleation. Next one is the grain structure in castings. Now, how will be the grain structure in castings? At the surface, heterogeneous nucleation takes place for few layers, this I have already told, because at the what say, remember the solidification starts from the mold wall and it progresses inside. Now, nearer to the mold wall, there will be impurities and because of these impurities, there will be heterogeneous nucleation. Now, because of this heterogeneous nucleation, right, equi-axed grains are formed. You see, these are the equi-axed grains, means of course, the first figure is at the uh, very first stage of the solidification. Now, this is a little advanced what is a solid, uh, stage of the solidification. Now, here we can see these are the equi-axed grains, means what does it mean? Their orientation is random they are neither horizontal or they may be horizontal, they may be vertical or they may be inclined, their orientation is random. So, in such a case, we call them as the equi-axed grains. Now, inside absence of sand particles, as the solidification is progressing inside, there would not be any what say impurities or the sand particles. That leads to homogeneously nucleated grains and their orientation from the surface to the center. These grains are known as the columnar grains. Because of the homogeneous nucleation, right, because of the what say absence of the impurities, there will be homogeneous nucleation and in such a case, columnar grains will be forming. You see, earlier we have seen equi-ax grains, now these are the columnar grains, means they are looking like columns. Now, when a column forms side arms, it is known as a dendrite. As the column is advancing towards the center of the casting, it also develops side arms. So, these are known as the dendrites, right. Now, the new nuclei resist the growth of the neighboring nuclei. Now, here the what say columnar grains are advancing from one side, from the other side also columnar grains are advancing. So, these will be interfering and they will be resisting each other. Finally, at the center, we can see there are again equi axed grains are there. So, that is how in a casting we can see uh, in the beginning there will be equi axed grains are there. Now, as the solidification is progressing, there will be columnar grains and at the center of the ca casting there again there will be equi axed grains. Columnar and dendritic structures are coarse and directional and they are undes undesirable in most of the situations. Columnar grains and dendritic grains are not suitable, they are not desirable. What is desirable is the equi axed grains are desirable. Now, we need to change this, this is what is a phenomenon, we have to control the solidification. Now, what we are doing, this can be changed in practice by adding nucleating agents which produce equi-axed grain structure in the entire casting. 
just now we have seen during the solidification at the beginning of the solidification there are impurities nearer to the mold wall because of these uh, impurities there was heterogeneous solidification and as the what say solidification is progressing inside there will be columnar grains will be there and again at the center there will be equiaxed grains so there is no uniformity in the grain structure this is what we don't want we want uniformity in the grain structures that's why we intentionally add nucleating agents in the molten metal so that these nucleating agents will be spread all over not only at the mold wall they will be spread all over the melt all over the molten metal so everywhere there will be heterogeneous solidification thus there will be what say uniform grain structure and here we can see this is a uniform grain structure now we need to for this we need to add nucleating agents external nucleating agents this we need to add intentionally after melting is over right so these are the nucleating agents for different alloys for aluminum alloys nucleating agents are titanium compounds like titanium right uh, al3 right next one uh, titanium boron titanium carbide next one for plain carbon steel the nucleasing agents are aluminum compounds and for stainless steel the nucleasing agents are calcium and magnesium cyanides for magnesium alloys the nucleating agents are zirconium carbide zirconium nitride and zirconium oxides and for cast iron the nucleating agents are sulfur components so these are the external nucleating agents which we add to the molten metal intentionally deliberately deliberately but at a very extremely small proportion so that they won't change the chemical composition but they will be changing the grain structure and they will be maintaining a uniform grain structure that is the purpose of the what say adding nucleating agents now there will be three basic types of cast structures in the what say castings one is the columnar dendritic equiaxed dendritic third one is the equiaxed non dendritic now let us see the first one this is the columnar dendritic means the basic structure is like a column but to that column there will be side dendrites are there second type is the equiax dendritic means these what say uh, what say what say crystals have what say random orientation they they don't have uniform orientation like the first one but again though they have the random orientation still they have the dendrites so this is the equiax dendritic structure and the third one is the equiax non dendritic structure means here there are what say grains are there crystals are there they have what say diff, random orientation and they don't have dendrites and this is a this is an ideal what say cast structure now solidification let us see the solidification of a pure metal so this is the solidification what say uh, structure of a pure metal crystallization of a pure metal now here we can we can see uh, the x axis is the time and y axis is the uh, temperature right so as the time progresses initially we may pour here this is the pouring temperature slowly it cools down and this is the uh, what say uh, crystallization uh, what say temperature here this is the place where crystallization starts in fact this is the freezing point at the freezing point actually the crystallization is supposed to start what happens is an undercooling is required right crystallization and freezing in a pure metal occurs at constant temperature so this is the freezing point at this freezing point or at this freezing temperature crystallization takes place however undercooling is required in the beginning to initiate the phenomenon of crystallization here we can see this is undercooling because of the undercooling the crystallization will be initiated now at a constant temperature right the crystallization takes place and once the crystallization is over once this crystallization is completed grains will be formed then the what's a casting is fully solidified now here it is the solid cooling 
So, this is the solidification of a pure metal. Now, a crystal nucleated at the mould wall grows first along the mould surface until it comes in contact with adjacent crystals that are also going along the mould surface. Now, here we can see this is the mould wall, this is the mould wall, this is one crystal. Now, how does growth takes place? In which direction it will be growing? It will be growing towards another crystal means along the mould wall, you see until it meets the next crystal, until it comes and comes in contact with the next crystal, it will be growing. So, that is the direction of growth of the crystals. Then what happens? A solid skin is thus formed which then grows perpendicular to the mould wall in a stable manner with a smooth flat solid liquid interface. This is called the planar mode of solidification. Now, what happened? Here there was one crystal and here there was one crystal. Likewise, there will be more crystals. Every crystal will be growing uh, what say moving and growing along the mould wall and they all will be joining. A skin will be formed. Once the skin is formed, then this skin will be growing perpendicular to the direction of the mould wall. Until then they are growing in this direction parallel to the mould wall. Now, a skin is formed you see, once the skin is formed, it will be growing perpendicular to the mould wall. So, this is known as the planar mode of solidification. Factors altering planar mode of solidification of pure metal, there are three factors. One is the absorption of gases, second one is reaction between crucible materials and the third one is the presence of impurities or alloys. When crystal grows, the actual temperature of the liquid may raise due to evolution of the latent heat. So, that is what we can see right in this picture. Growth of crystal along the mould wall is stopped at some stage and secondary arms of primary crystals grow inside the liquid. And here we can see uh, this is the initial, uh, this is at the early stage of solidification, this is the primary crystals, all are what say growing parallel to the mould wall, then a skin is formed. Once the skin is formed, it is growing perpendicular to the mould wall, but how they are growing? Like a column, this is known as the dendrite. So, this is one known as one dendrite. So, this is another dendrite and this is another dendrite. Not only that, each dendrite will be developing side arms like this. Say this is one side arm, this is one side arm. Likewise, every dendrite will be developing side arms. Again, every side arm will be developing more side arms. Now, the resultant tree like structure is known as dendritic structure. Now, let us see the dendritic growth. We have seen the what say crystals grow like dendrites and there will be a dendritic structure. Now, let us see the dendritic growth. The term dendrite comes from the Greek word dendron, which means a tree. Almost all freshly crystallized alloys are composed of many thousands, even millions of dendritic crystal all stuck together. And here we can see this is the dendritic structure. You see, there are several what say columns are there, columnar structures are there and each column has got the side arms. Again, each side arm has got more side arms. So, that is the dendritic tree or the dendritic structure. And yes, this is the first stage of the dendritic growth, right. This is the solid and this is the liquid and they will be growing means here is this side is the mould wall means the towards the left side is the mould wall, it is already solidified and this is towards the centre of the casting means the right side and this is the direction of the growth of the what say arms, the columnar grains. Now, these are the dendritic arms. Now, this is the second stage of dendritic growth, right. Every what say dendritic arm will be developing side arms. Finally, this is the final stage of the dendritic growth. You see, everywhere there are 
what say dendritic structures are there and there are side arms are there. Each side arm has developed more and more side arms. Likewise, they all will be what say covering the entire mould, finally they will be joining together. And this is the typical dendritic structure in an alloy. You can see so many dendrites are there, so many side arms are there. So, this is the dendritic structure in an alloy. Next one, solidification of alloy let us see. Now, cool, this is the cooling curve for an alloy during casting. Now, here we can see two figures, first one is the phase diagram of copper nickel alloy system. So, this is here we can see, uh, this is the what is a nickel and as we go towards right, the copper content is increasing and here it is 100 percent copper and here it is 100 percent nickel. Now, we are considering 50 percent nickel and 50 percent copper, that be the case, yes, we can go like this, but this is the what is a phase diagram for the copper nickel alloy system. At 50 percent nickel and 50 percent copper, this is the cooling curve and here we can see again this is the liquidus line, means above this liquidus line everything is liquid and this is the solidus line, below this solidus line everything is solid and between liquidus line and so what is a solidus line there will be a mushy zone, means liquid plus solid. Now, this is the cooling curve for 50 percent nickel and 50 percent copper. Now, most alloys freeze over a temperature range rather than at a single temperature. In case of a pure metal, the crystallization takes place at a constant temperature, whereas in the case of an alloy, the crystallization and also or the freezing takes place over a temp temperature range. Right? Here we can see this is the pouring temperature. Now, at from pouring temperature, there will be liquid cooling will, will be there. How long this liquid cooling will be there? Till the freezing point. Yes, this is the freezing point. Here the freezing begins. Now, from this point to this point, freezing will be continuing. You see, the temperature is not constant. The temperature is coming down and the what is the freezing? continuous and here the freezing is totally what is a completed and it became a solid casting. Still from solid casting to the uh, what say it will be cooling down to the ambient temperature. So, this is the solid cooling. So, from this point to this point it is the solidification time. So, what we can learn from this graph the what say freezing in an alloy occurs uh, over a range not at a constant temperature as in the case of a pure metal. Now, solidification of alloys, right, what happens? In alloys, the rates of growth of crystal at the mould wall are different due to many factors, due to wettability or non-uniform, right, mould wall and so on, right. So, the growth of crystals is not uniform, whereas in the case of the pure metals, it was uniform it will be uniform and here we can see there will be uh, segregation will be there right and here we can see solid liquid uh, interface uh, is there. Next one non-uniform solute segregation is here we can see. Likewise, there will be preferential growth will be there right. The rate of segregation of solute will also be different in different areas of the interface and because of that you can see the solidification will not be uniform. And here we can see more solute segregation is there and there will be preferential growth will be there. Now, when a metal contains a small amount of solute, the projections that preferentially grow may develop in a non-equilibrium manner. Next, as the solute concentration increases, the plain and smooth shape solid liquid interface of pure metal will progressively develop into more extreme morphologies termed as nodes, cells and dendritic structures. Now, here we see a what is a one case study, right. The solidification patterns for grey cast iron in a 180 mm square casting, right. After 11 minutes of cooling, dendrites reach each other. You see here the right, but the casting is still in 
Moshi zone throughout. It takes about 2 hours for the complete solidification. Now, here wha what happens? These are the what is a dendrites in the initial stage may be after 8 minutes. After these dendrites will be growing towards the center. At the same time from the other side also dendrites will be growing. They all will be growing in the opposite direction. Yes, after 11 minutes they have met one another right here. Now what happens? There will be more side arms will be there. Side arms and more and more side arms we can see here. Finally, nearly after 102 minutes this mushy zone has completed, has come to an end and there is complete solidification. Next one, modes of freezing of alloys. There are three important modes of freezing of alloys. One is the freezing at constant temperature by precipitating simultaneously two or three phases. These alloys are known as eutectics. And the second mode is start and complete their freezing as solid solutions. These alloys are known as eutectoids, there is a difference. And the third mode is a solid phase and a liquid phase will together form a second solid phase at a constant temperature. These are known as peritectoids. Now let us see this one by one. Let us see the first mode of freezing. Freezing at constant temperature by precipitating simultaneously two or three phases and these are known as eutectics. Now the best example is in the aluminum silicon phase diagram when the silicon proportion is 12.6 percent and when the temperature is 577 degrees, liquid phase directly transforms into solid phase without passing through any mushy zone. I will show the phase diagram. Yes, this is the aluminum silicon phase diagram and here you can see this is the liquidus and again this is the liquidus. Above the liquidus everything is liquid and this is the solidus. Below the solidus everything is solid. Now here we can see this is the mushy zone and here also we can see mushy zone. So generally in, when an alloy is solidifying right, first there will be liquid cooling then it reaches the liquid line then after that it will be passing through the mushy zone means there will be liquid and solid then finally it will be crossing the solidus line finally there will be complete solid. Now in this case let us see when the silicon proportion is 12.6 percent and when the temperature is 577 degrees centigrade you see this point what happens here it is liquid above this point everything is liquid. Now, if you cool below 577 degrees centigrade, it solidifies, there is no mushy zone, right. So, that is how it is freezing at constant temperature by precipitating simultaneously two or three phases. So, these are known as the eutectics. Now, let us see the second case, start and complete their freezing as solid solutions. These are known as eutectoids and the best example is in the aluminum what say sorry in the iron carbide phase diagram when carbon proportion is 0 0.68 percent three phases they are ferrite, austenite, austenite uh, right uh, plus cementite react at 738 degree centigrade and form alpha ferrite a shape similar to eutectic reaction these are known as the eutectoids there the phase diagram will be similar to the eutectic phase diagram. But in the case of the eutectic phase diagram, just above the eutectic point everything is liquid, below the liquid eutectic point everything is solid. Like a V shape, here also we can see like a V shape, but the phenomenon is not similar, there is a difference. What is that? Let us see. Before that, let us learn about the what say the terms which we have come across in this uh, st case study. One is the ferrite, ferrite or the alpha iron is the low temperature form of iron. It has a body center cubic structure and has up to 0 0.035 percentage weight of carbon dissolved in solid solution. It has a BCC structure you see means very little amount of carbon is dissolved. Second one is the austenite. On heating pure iron 
right on heating pure iron changes into austenite or gamma iron at 914 degrees centigrade and switches from BCC structure to FCC structure. Pure austenite is stable at up to 1391 degrees centigrade. Right. Gamma iron that is the FCC having FCC structures contains up to 2.1 percentage weight of carbon dissolved in solid solution. So, it has a FCC structure. Next one, pure austenite is stable up to 1391 degree centigrade when it changes back to another BCC structure. Delta iron right before melting at 1530 degrees centigrade. Next one, cementite is iron carbide a compound at the right hand edge of the diagram. Now, let us see the uh, case uh, 2, start and complete their freezing as solid solutions right. This is the iron carbide phase diagram. Now, let us consider this case where the carbon content is 0 0.68 percent. Now, you see wa wa what happens here, start and complete their freezing as solid solution. Now, here what is this? This is the austenite means it is a solid. Now, as the temperature is coming down, what happens? This is the once the temperature falls below this temperature that is the 738 degree centigrade, again the structure will be changing, ferrite will be forming. Means what is happening? Start and complete their freezing as solid solutions. We can see only solid solutions before the final solidification. So, this is the second case. Next one, let us see the case 3. A solid phase and a liquid phase will together form a second solid phase at a constant temperature. These are known as peritectoids. For this, the best example again is the iron carbide phase diagram. When the carbon content is less than 2 percent, the solidification is as follows, right. From liquid to liquid plus austenite, again from liquid plus austenite to austenite and from austenite to ferrite. Again, this is the iron carbide phase diagram. We can see here, when the carbon content is a say at about say uh, 1.2 percent or so, what is happening here? We can see different phases will be there from liquid to liquid plus austenite. So, this is the liquid and this is liquid plus austenite. Again, from liquid plus austenite to it is going to it is form becoming austenite. From austenite, it is becoming austenite plus we, we can see austenite to ferrite. So, this is the ferrite. Likewise, what is happening? We can see there will be solid what say phase will be there, right. A solid phase and a liquid phase will together to form a second solid phase at a constant temperature. That is the exact phenomenon taking place in the case 3. Now, let us see the problems associated with the solidification. These are the three problems, shrinkage defect, hot tearing and evolution of gases. Now, uh, the shrinkage defect we have already uh, covered earlier and we have uh, what say seen how to uh, design a riser to take care of the shrinkage defect. Again, let us review the causes for the shrinkage defects. One is the insufficient size of the riser. Second one is the improper location of riser. Third one casting design and fourth one is the progressive solidification. Now, these are the uh, what say causes for the shrinkage defect. One has to design the riser sufficiently large, so that it can feed the what say casting throughout the solidification process. Next one, one has to place the riser in the right location. For example, you see uh, this is the casting and this is the riser. Now, what happens? The solidification starts from a what say far away point right or a uh, a small uh, a thinner section will be solidifying first. This uh, portion will be solidifying first. Slowly the progression uh, the solidification will be progressing towards the center of the casting. Now, initially this is solidifying and the razor is connected towards this portion. Once this solidifies, the liquid metal in the razor cannot feed the casting. So, that way 
the riser is located in a wrong place. On the other hand, let us see the, this case and now, now here the riser is located in the opposite direction, means what is, what is happening? The thinner section which solidifies first is away from the riser. Now, yes, let it solidify first, yes, slowly the solidification will be progressing inside and the casting solidifies. Till the casting is completely solidified, the riser will be supplying the liquid metal to the casting. So, this is the correct location of riser. So, that way improper location of the riser sometimes leads to shrinkage defect. Next one, casting design also sometimes results in the shrinkage defect. Now, let us see a case study. Now, this is the casting and you see here and somewhere here there will be riser. Now, what happens here because the section thickness is very large, here there will be shrinkage defect. So, this we need to for the to overcome this defect, we need to slightly modify the casting design. On the other hand, you see here the design is little improved. Instead of what say making a thick section here, that thick section is removed here, you see. Now, in such a case, the shrinkage defect may not occur in the second case. So, improper design of the casting also results in the shrinkage defect. And the third one, uh, uh, sorry, the last one is the progressive solidification. In the beginning itself or in during the uh, what say early lectures, when we were talking about discussing about the design of the riser, we were talking about the progressive solidification. Again, I will review. Progressive solidification means what here? Say this is the casting, right? So, this is the riser. The solidification can progress like this parallel to the axis of the casting. Then it is known as the directional solidification. Yes, slowly the solidification will be progressing towards the what say riser. In such a case, riser will be feeding the casting. On the other hand, you can see here this is the progressive solidification means the solidification progresses perpendicular to the axis of the casting. This red colored one is the axis of the casting, the solidification is progressing perpendicular to that. Then what will happen? Slowly it will be closing the path, maybe the riser will be somewhere here and this path will be closed, somewhere there will be a shrinkage defect will be there. Because the what say path is closed, the riser cannot feed liquid metal to that uh, place where there is a shrinkage cavity. Why this is happening? because of the progressive solidification. Yes, in a solidification both directional solidification and progressive solidification will be there, but progressive solidification should not dominate, only the directional solidification has to dominate, right. So, excessive of progressive solidification leads to shrinkage defect. Now, we have to analyze how to what say control this progressive solidification. Once we can control the progressive solidification or once we know the factors that are influencing the progressive solidification, we can very well control uh, the shrinkage defect. Factors influencing progressive solidification. One is the high conductivity and high heat capacity results in steep gradient and high degree of progressive solidification. Remember when high heat, large amount of heat is to be dissipated from the casting to the mold wall, it will choose the axial radial direction of the casting, right. Or when a small amount of heat is to be dissipated, it will be choosing the axial direction. So, in both the directions, the heat can be dissipated, remember, but when large amount of heat is to be dissipated, it will be choosing the axial direction means perpendicular to the, uh, uh, the radial direction, perpendicular to the x of the uh, what say casting. Now, here high conductivity and high heat capacity, what happens? Large amount of heat is to be dissipated to the mold wall. In such a case, what will happen? The heat will be dissipated radially means perpendicular to the axis of the casting. In such a case, progressive solidification will be more and it will be dominating or high, there will be high degree of progressive solidification. On the other hand, low conductivity, low heat capacity, what happens? Large, very small amount of heat is to be dissipated. In such a case, it will be choosing along the what say axial direction, parallel to the axis it will be dissipating. In such a case, the progressive solidification will be very smaller. Now, there is another factor 
which influences the progressive solidification. Short freezing range results in high degree of what is a progressive solidification and we have learned that an alloy solidifies over a freezing range not at a constant temperature. Now, when this freezing range is very small, what happens? Whatever heat it has, it has to be dissipated in a short time. In such a case, it will be choosing the radial direction means perpendicular to the x of the casting. In such a case, there will be more progressive solidification. On the other hand, if it, there is a long freezing range, what happens? It has sufficient time for solidification then it may choose the axial direction means parallel to the axis uh, the heat will be dissipated. In such a case, there will be lesser progressive solidification and more directional solidification. We want more directional solidification, we want less progressive solidification. Next, there is another factor which influences the progressive solidification. High what is a freezing temperature results in steep gradient and high degree of progressive solidification. Now, what is a freezing temperature or the melting temperature is at a very high temperature, high freezing temperature. Then what happens from say such a, such a high temperature, it has to cool down means the ambient temp, what is the difference between the high pouring temperature to the ambient temperature? There is a means there is a steep gradient is there because of that more heat is to be dissipated to the mold wall. In such a case, it will be choosing the what is a radial direction perpendicular to the x of the casting. In such a case, there will be high degree of progressive solidification. On the other hand, let us see this one, low freezing temperature results in mild gradient and low degree of progressive solidification. Here, the what is a, the liquidus and solid line are not very high. Here, they are at a very high temperature, liquidus line and solidus line. You can see here and here they are at a lower temperature, means the gradient is not a steep gradient, it is a small gradient. Because of that, lesser amount will be dissipating to the mold wall. Then in such a case, it will be choosing the axial direction parallel to the x of the job. In such a case, there will be more directional solidification and less progressive solidification. Next one is the hot tearing. Now, these are the uh, what is a uh, you can see here this is the casting and this is the what is a crack that has occurred during the solidification of the casting right. And there are reasons for that one is the differential contraction, next one chemical composition and long freezing range are the causes for the hot tearing right. Here inside we have kept a core because of that there was differential contraction. Next one is the chemical composition. We know that the cast iron and the steel, they contain extremely small amount of sulphur, maybe 0 0.06 percent, right. So, that sometimes that will be useful, it improves the machinability. But if this sulphur content is more, it can cause cracking to the casting. Next one, long freezing range also causes hot tearing. Next one, evolution of the gases. So, this is another problem associated, associated with solidification. Now, what are the sources of gases in molten metal? One is the atmospheric humidity, second one is the wet metallic charge, third one is the wet furnace lining, fourth one wet foundry instruments, next one wet fluxes and other consumables, next one furnace fuel containing hydrogen. So, these factors will be influencing evolution of gases in the molten metal. So, in this lecture, we have seen the solidification phenomenon and the crystallization grains and the what is a complete solidification we have seen and we have seen the solidification phenomenon of a pure metal, the solidification phenomenon of an alloy we have seen and also we have seen the factors influencing progressive solidification and also the directional solidification and the other problems we have seen like the hot tearing, shrinkage defect and the gases. And in, the, in our next lecture, we will be learning about the what is a shake out, fettling and what is a finishing of the solidified casting. Thank you.